I am Jenny Reindorp. I'm Interim Director of Programmes at NHS Providers, and I'm really delighted to welcome you all to this breakout session on improvement and resilience, where we're looking at how we improvement approaches can help boards maintain good outcomes for patients and service users in these really challenging times. You may well have seen um, research last year by the Health Foundation's Q Community, which is a network of improvers across the country. They've got a stand in our exhibition space and that showed the value of a structured and systematic approach to improvement led by the board and really owned across the organisation, um, how that really helped trusts respond to the uh, shocks and challenges of the pandemic. And uh, you may also have seen the recent evaluation of the uh, five trusts that work with the Virginia Mason Institute to build a culture of continuous improvement. And that very much showed the same, that quality improvement practices were really critical in enabling frontline staff to make the rapid pivots to their working practices that COVID-19 uh, required and, and meant that there was an agreed <coughs> approach to solving complex problems that could be applied quickly in response. Just welcoming delegates who are joining us at this session. Do grab a seat and do come to the front, the front of the table, the tables at the front <laughs> if you can. <laughs> Just spread us all out. Yeah. Welcome, do come and take a seat. Just doing some introductions. Um, and in terms of the focus of this session today, with significant change and, and challenge, now the norm in the NHS, what we want to look at is how we build on some of that insight from that research and from your experience uh, by bringing together some board members and members of the Health Foundation's Q community to look at the role that systematic approaches can play within your organisation to respond to the uh, ever-changing environment that we're now in. We're not going to have uh, set presentations, so we've got a fan on PowerPoint for, for, for this slot. Uh, and we're going to aim to have a, just a conversation, really, that we can bring you in um, with. And we want to really try and see if we can focus today on some of the very practical takeaways on the role of the board and what leaders could be doing differently um, based on the learning from my panel here to really drive a culture of continuous improvement within organisations and also across systems. A um, little bit of housekeeping. I think, allegedly, Glissa is now working. I've got it's, It is flashing in front of me. So if you do have a question that you'd like to pose, um, do use Glissa. And I've got some colleagues from NHS providers at the back with a microphone. So if you also just want to raise your hand, uh, do come in. And we'll take questions as we, as we go along. So... Um, do just uh, pop them in glitter or, or, or pop up your hand. So without further ado, I'm just going to kick off now and I'm going to ask the panel members to introduce themselves as they go along. And I'm going to ask Glenn to get the ball rolling and just open, ask each panelist to open with some reflections on the role that systematic or you know, continuous improvement plays in the resilience of your organisation. So Glenn, uh, over to you first. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Glenn Burley. I'm Chief Executive of what we call the Foundation Group, which is South Warwickshire Foundation Trust, George Elliott Trust, and Y Valley NHS Trust. We're not, we're not, they're not neighbours, actually. Um, but they're three providers of integrated acute and community services that uh, are the lead providers that place. So I'll talk a little bit about that later. But I thought I'd just kick off by talking about our group approach to improvement. Uh, we use QSA. Um, and actually the evaluation that you referred to shows that actually under the bonnet lots of improvement me methodologies are broadly the same. So I don't think you necessarily need to have a particular type, but I think you need to have one. Um, so one of the things that we have within our group, even though we've got three sovereign organisations brought together through a common chair and a chief exec and a committee in common, we don't actually standardise lots of things. We've got some standardised governance standardised exec portfolios, but I'm really quite insistent that we, we have an improvement methodology and it features very strongly as one of the things we must do. So each trust has an improvement board and we also have a, a sharing event in each trust which highlights best practice uh, and learning from, from improvement methodologies. Um, two other things to say, I mean, so you need to have one. Why do you need to have one? Well, two things I'd, I'd say on that one. Firstly, 
we need to improve. We're never the finished article. And one of the things that we'll often talk about is a relentless pursuit of excellence within our group. So we've got South Warwickshire, which is a segment one outstanding rated organisation, but that was kind of yesterday, and our approach has to be, can we do it today, can we do it tomorrow? We're in an ever-changing environment, so that focus on making sure that we're as efficient as we can be, that the outcomes are as good as they can be, um, is there for all of us. And um, we've only got to look at the way the NHS is performing to, for us all to say we could do better. I think the other reason why this is important is probably the more significant one for me, is what it means to staff. Um, and I suppose uh, going through what we went through with COVID gave me two learnings from that. One is the great examples of when clinicians were put into leadership roles and were able to try things out and innovate um, and really got um, some great results from that. And actually many of those clinicians have stayed in leadership roles um, post-COVID. Compared to actually being a chief exec and being in a level four incident and having people basically tell you what to do um, kind of told me that I quite like being in control and therefore staff in our organisations want to feel in control and want to feel they can make a difference uh, and want to feel that they can improve. So I think um, it's really important for recruitment and retention. Many thanks, Glenn. Um, and Elsa, I'll take you next. Okay, good morning everyone. My name's Elsa Roberts and I'm the Director of Continuous Improvement at Lancashire Teaching Hospitals. And I would really echo what um, Glenn has just said. For me, method matters. I think it's improvement science that the organisations that have really managed to get to outstanding have adopted. So it's the robust application of the quality improvement methodology that really delivers some of those results that Glenn has described that in Lancashire Teaching we are desperately working to deliver um, at pace. For me, I think we're starting to learn a bit more about what is really successful from an improvement science perspective. And for me, what really matters is making sure that the investment in improvement methodology is appropriate for the level of improvement that you want to see. So we'll probably come on to talk about improvement within systems, but actually the approach we've taken following a review of the evidence base around improvement science and looking globally at who does this the best we've been very disciplined about making sure that we apply a methodology for um, macro, meso and micro level. So when we've got the complexity of improvement across a whole organisation or system, we are trying very hard to embrace that complexity and to make sure we create the culture and context for improvement to flourish. Some of you will have seen the improvement review that Amanda Pritchard has just um, commissioned and actually the work in there around pathway level improvement I think is critical to us as an organisation. So we use the Flow Coaching Academy methodology so we're really deliberate about which of our clinical pathways we need to improve to get the results that Glenn's just described. And then we've also got a method which is um, quite similar to CUSA but has a bit more focus on coaching around how do we really build the capability in our organisation for all of our frontline staff not only to do improvement as they do their day job but to coach others who haven't had the improvement training. So that's a very structured systematic approach that we're trying to adopt in Lancs Teaching. Lovely, thanks Elsa for kicking us off um, and uh, can I go to you John? for perspective from the Northern Care Alliance. Yeah, sure. So I'm uh, John Bellaby. I work with the uh, Director of Quality Improvement at the Northern Care Alliance. So we're four uh, what we call care organisations that have acute and community services within them, so Salford, Bury, Rochdale and Oldham. And we've gone through a transaction recently over the last four years, but legally since October 2021. Um, so my reflections on the question. So we know that when people feel involved in improvement and feel able to make improvements in the care that they give and changes to the way that they deliver that care, that they have a greater degree of job satisfaction. So we know that we are facing challenges in, as an, an NHS around keeping our people happy and uh, retaining our staff. So I believe that a, a quality improvement really can help play a fundamental part in that. So our experience around quality improvement, um, so I've worked in QI for 15 years, and we very much focused on an, an IHI approach, Institute for Healthcare Improvement, so large-scale collaboratives. But as we've gone through uh, the changing context of the NHS and the changing context of the organisation, like ELSA, 
we've recognised actually that there's a lot more that we need to do around uh, equipping our people to improve quality more substantially. So in my early years in quality improvement, we thought that doing large scale quality improvement collaboratives would do that for us, but actually not having a, a dedicated programme to do that outside of the QI projects, I think <coughs> was something that we learned and have since uh, looked to do far better. The challenges I think that we face in terms of QI and, and resilience in the organisation now is exactly as uh, Elsa said around the complexity of the pathways of care that we now have to try and improve. And I think the challenges around that are that as organisations become groups or different uh, formations of healthcare organisations, I think we have a challenge as to how we work across those organisations to improve quality. When you have the, the, the problem within the four walls of your organisation, there are levers that you can pull to make improvements happen and to get people involved. I think as the organisations become more complex and have uh, parts of the pathway that don't exist within your control, it's harder to get people uh, involved in that improvement. And I think that's something that we need to think about for the future. Thanks very much, John. And I think let's come back to the kind of challenge of, of how you do this uh, really difficult work within your trust across organisational boundaries. So I'm just going to bring in Elliot for your initial reflections. Great, thank you. So uh, I'm Elliot Howard-Jones. I'm the Chief Executive of Hertfordshire Community NHS Trust. Um, I get all the points around um, improvement methodologies, but I'm going to talk about practical engagement of staff um, and how we enthuse and engage staff and how we understand it as a, as a board. So th three things, really. One... The first is, I think it's really important during difficult times uh, to have quality and improvement as a real focus. We had that um, during COVID. I think the question now is we're not, it's not if we're going to face difficult times, if we're going to be short of staff. It's what is our response when we are short of staff and how do we maintain a quality approach when we are short of staff? As, a, as an organisation, we made sure during COVID that the one committee structure that we kept in place throughout COVID was the quality committee in full because actually those were the difficult decisions around quality that we needed to make during the pandemic that we needed to make with rigour and with challenge um, across the organisation. The second is about engagement in um, improvement, if you like, across the organisation. <laughs> so I'll draw three distinct levels of, of types of improvement. One is about continuous improvement, uh, the second is about change management, the third is about transformation. And I completely get for change management, which is a project, you know, PID, managing a Gantt chart type improvement, uh, you need an improvement methodology, I kind of get it for transformation as well. I'm not sure for continuous improvement, we don't just need to change the attitude of our staff to empower our staff to make the changes they think are obvious in front of them. I don't know whether that actually requires an improvement methodology, I don't know whether it requires training, or whether it actually just Im it, it requires us to release <coughs> our staff to feel confident um, and able to make those decisions and those changes. Which leads me on to the third point really, which is about culture change. This is about changing the culture of an organisation we heard in the, the plenary before around EDI about releasing the diversity of thought and diversity of talent across the organisation. This is about that diversity of thought and diversity of talent being able to apply their minds and apply their knowledge to services that they ultimately know much better than I do. Uh, and I'm not sure bringing everything up to a central point within the board is, uh, or an improvement methodology is always helpful. Um, Actually, it's about the board understanding what the context of that is, triangulating the data. What are we seeing in terms of risks of the organisation? What are we seeing in terms of the staff survey? What are we seeing in terms of different sources of data to understand where the risks are in the organisation and where we need to ask our staff to come up with innovative, different approaches to those solutions? So I think, for me, I don't disagree with the improvement methodology, but I think we need to think carefully as a board about when we apply it and when we need to take a different approach, which is about empowering and releasing our staff to, to use the knowledge and the ability they have to change their own services. Thank you very much for that, Elliot. And I'm wondering if I could ask you all to say a little bit more about, because there's been a theme there, obviously, about methodology and the, you know, the, the place in that, but how do you actually practically empower staff 
and unleash some of that kind of job satisfaction, the ability to kind of come to work to do the work and, and improve care at the same time. What, what kind of examples could you give about what the board has had to do differently, how it's led differently to kind of encourage that cultural shift? And I wonder if I could go back to Glenn first on that one. And, and after this round, we'll see what questions there are from delegates. Yeah, it's definitely about the board creating the space and making it everyone's business, but also being permissive about change. Um, so I mentioned that we, we celebrate this. So each trust, so we've got Transformation Tuesday at Y Valley, we've got Fab Friday at George Elliott, and we've got Open to Change at, at Swift. And, and, and those are opportunities for anyone to come in and tell us about their improvement project, including the ones that have gone wrong. So. Um, we, 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 uh, we have fabulous failure uh, as part of our, our learning there. And actually, all of us, we, we all learn more from the things that go wrong than the things that go right. Uh, so fabulous failure is all about saying, actually, tell us what you tried to do, tell us what, how you measured it and how things changed, and then learn from it. So as long as we learn from it, that's the best thing. And I think, I think the test for any board is what you do when a change project goes wrong. Uh, and getting alongside the team and helping them to, to measure it and, and try something different is so important rather than the kind of seizing control. We heard that this morning, didn't we? Stepping in and seizing control. So I think where you position improvement is important. So, so one other thing that, that we've done particularly is, is, is remove the silos because one thing I was conscious of, Chief Finance Officer have got their cost improvement and we've got quality improvement with some of the clinical leads uh, and so we've just got one improvement um, resource and it concentrates on all of those things and we've also put improvement in the portfolio of uh, the chief strategy officers so whenever there's a business case being thought of the first question is could we do this differently can we improve that system that process before we actually invest in it um, and we've also made all of our board members do the uh, we do bronze silver gold training for all of our staff so all of our board have done that training so they can understand that what the staff are going through and the skills that they've then got fantastic thanks glenn some really good practical examples and i think um the fabulous failure uh, uh banner i'm sure has um, been a powerful one I, I wonder if elliot you could also um just give some examples of practically some of the work that you've been doing to kind of listen to staff and uh and encourage kind of local managers to take ownership of where there are issues in, in their services. So I know there's something that you've been working on. Yeah, so two, two things really. One is about, is back playing back to the empowerment point of view and creating a space where staff can feel listened to. Uh, over the course of these two days, I'm sure you'll have a number of conversations over coffee, some of which uh, you'll feel genuinely listened to and some of which you'll feel that someone's not quite listening all the time. And I think this is, um, it's really important to create a culture of really being open and um, uh, open to really hearing about the improvement that's gone on and really supportive of it and really uh, uh, backing it up. So a couple of practical examples on that. Um, I do a session every uh, fortnight, which is an open mic session. I, f I sometimes feel like I'm a, a radio host rather than a, rather than a chief exec during those sessions, but actually they're really helpful for understanding what is bubbling up through the organisation, what is creating anxiety and what people have done fabulously well um, during that time. The, uh, we do lots around peer reviews, we do lots about accreditation reviews, there's a pre-CQC, so we do a mock CQC, so some people are inspectors and some people are um, being inspected. So I think that's really helpful actually in terms of gaining organisational understanding about what other people are doing in different bits of the organisation that can then be translated uh, across. Um, so we do uh, those things. I think we also, from a management uh, point of view, in terms of managing the immediate, um, we have a thing. So when you go to London, there's a um, on the screen. There's a when you get to the, onto the tube, there's a tube lines list all the tube lines and whether they're running fully or whether they're part suspended or whether they're um, fully suspended. And we do a tube lines running diagram for our organisation. Every service line within it. Um, it's discussed every Tuesday and Thursday by uh, the bronze group, which is the operational management group, and they now chair it themselves. It started off being chaired by a member of the exec, and actually it was much more powerful to have 
the individual organization, individual um, departments sharing it because actually they are then volunteering their staff to go and help in another area that needs uh, a sort of operational response or needs some improvement response within it. So it's much more generated from uh, the staff themselves rather than being run top down, which you, much, you get a much fuller response and you get a much um, more interactive response from the department. So a couple of examples in there. Fantastic. Thanks, Elliot. I love the train uh, tube analogy. Um, I'm going to pick up some questions from delegates now. And um, Elsa, one that's come up here is uh, really a, a kind of continuation of that theme about the change in the way your executive team works on a daily basis as a result of adopting the QI approach. I wonder if you could reflect on that for us. Okay, absolutely. So um, I think our executives made a commitment at the start of our continuous improvement journey when I joined the organisation to really um, take the learning from some of Mary D Dixon Woods' work around connecting the sharp end um, to the blunt end of an organisation and really, as, as you've just described, really going to understand what it's like to work at our front line. So um, in just the same way that your boards do your improvement training, ours do too. Um, so almost half of our executive team coach a big room every week. There are some of um, our members in this room that do that, um, that you might want to talk to about their experience. But that has connected our executive team to our clinicians and frontline leaders who are doing the improvement work. And I think it just gives us a different insight into how difficult some of the changes are to make. And it's allowed us to have some different conversations about our approaches. I think the other thing we've done differently is really use measurement for improvement differently. So there was a, a really great blog um, published on the Health Foundation website from 2013, and Maxine wrote it, Maxine's in the room with us, that talks about what good boards do and what great boards do around measures for success. And I think that's a really big difference I've seen in our executive team because we now, using measurement for improvement, really understand where the things are that we really need to focus. And we spend less time looking at some of the rag-rated data that doesn't really tell us very much about how well our system is performing. And we really focus together on the things that we really need to invest our improvement energy and effort into as, a, as an entire organization to really begin to shift some of those metrics. Fantastic. Getting some really good questions here from, from you all in the room. Um, John, can I ask you to pick up this one here about how do you help and support staff to engage with improvement when things are so pressured operationally? So not just the time for training, but having the time and the headspace to identify and deliver improvements. I'm sure that's a, a question that resonates with everybody in the room. Yeah, as I suppose from our perspective at the Northern Care Alliance, it, it is really challenging. I think particularly through 2021, we recognised that we had sort of stood down the programme of QI work <coughs> during COVID, and we recognised the impact that that was having on our staff and the quality of care uh, that patients experienced in some respects. So I think it, there is no denying that to do improvement requires you to stop and think and to do things differently. So that is an honest conversation that you have to have. But what we did as a quality improvement team, particularly around that, was try and be really respectful of just what it is like at that time. So pre-COVID, we would have had a relatively hard line on, for example, an organisation-wide project on, on improving a particular issue. We would have had a pretty hard line on standing that down at relatively short notice. But during COVID, we recognised, or, or at least during 2021, we recognised that actually we had to be far more flexible around that. So we considered different ways of going and working with our frontline team. So as a QI team, we would go and we would work with them directly in the clinical areas, which we would do a lot anyway, but we would do a lot of the bulk of the project work actually in the clinical areas and making ourselves available at a time that works for the people who work in the system. Because we know that they are the people who work in the system, they understand the patients, they understand their colleagues, they understand the environment. So to improve that system, you can't do it without them. Um, so I, I guess shorthand, really, we've tried to be much more respectful of just how challenging it has been recently and to adopt our practices as a result of that. We also try and make things available. So we have a, a workforce capa capability program and we have, based on sort of the Dartmouth clinical microsystems approach, we have coaching and kickstart offers, which are sort of different lengths of capability programs. 
um, that people can apply to uh, be a part of. So they have to frame the problem they want to work on, identify the team, and then we will go to them and work with that team to provide the QI support with them. So I think just sort of in summary, really, being more respectful of the situation that we're in contextually and also trying to take the QI team to uh, the teams that need our help. Fantastic. Thanks, John. Are there any other comments from other panellists? Elliot? Yeah, so I, I, I think it's really important at this point to, to understand the difference or understand the payoff as opposed to the time that people are putting in. So some of the big improvement projects take a lot of time and people go, yeah, do I see the benefit of it? And I think we need to be mindful in times when resourcing is stretched about whether we're applying uh, or, or asking people to participate in the right areas that are going to give enough payoff. But I also think it's important to then separate continuous improvement from change management and transformation. So change management and transformation may need a weekly board to bring stuff together. They may need a monthly board, an oversight board. Actually, I think continuous improvement doesn't. I think a lot of people within our organizations get frustrated that they go, why can't I just change this? Because it makes no sense in my daily life. And actually, if they could change it really quickly, it would free up time rather than consume time. So I think there's, there's both a challenge in terms of are we looking at the right areas and are we asking people to participate in the right things? But also back to that point of why don't we just free people up from having to do it as part of a improvement type project and just go, this is rubbish. I could do it differently. Why don't I just get on with it? Glenn, do you come on and Yeah, I think I'd be quite worried if I could stop improvement in, in my <laughs> organisations, actually, um, because uh, there's probably a, a roughly a 50-50 mix between the things that are, that are ground up, uh, ideas that people come up with and problems that they face, their lived experiences that they want to fix, versus the, the more strategic things that, that are linked to the board strategy or objectives. Um, but even those come from engagement with staff about things we need to fix. So uh, when it gets tough, people actually want to be more innovative, uh, I find, uh, and certainly want to take control of the problem. Um, and so, yeah, I think organisations are, uh, are heading for the rocks if they, if they think they can stop those kind of things or try to mm -hmm. during those really pressured times. Great insights there. I'm not sure whether Glissa platform has gone down, but I, I wonder if someone could grab my tablet because unfortunately all your fantastic questions have disappeared. So I'm just going to go on on the ones that are in my um, that I've clocked that are in my mind. Um, <laughs> one that one that came up from one of you was about um, risk management, and we've talked a little bit about fabulous failure and encouraging people to innovate. And there was a question from a delegate, um, and do someone come in if you ask that question and want to elaborate about risk management ap appetite of exec teams and whether uh, you've adjusted that to kind of reflect the kind of focus on innovation and experimentation. So any kind of um, comments from the panel on that one? Glenn, do you want to start off? Yes, we have. Um, and I suppose some of that comes with where the each organisation is, and all three organisations are in a slightly different place, and I recognise that it's, it's harder to have a huge risk appetite when organisations are under, under the, the cosh or under regulatory pressure. Um, but one of the things I think my, is key to my role is, 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 is making some of the regulators back off <laughs> during those moments uh, and free up that, um, the ability of the staff to, to, to innovate. So. We haven't consciously said, yeah, we're, we're, we're up for this kind of change, but we've gone, through, we've gone through each of our services and identified the ones that actually need to make more improvements versus those that are in a more mature position around their quality improvement approach and given more resources to those that, that do. And what we try to do with resources, I suppose, is that other, other panel members have made is, I don't, want, I don't want lots of improvement specialists, lots of black belts in improvement in the organisation. Their, their role, re those people, they're there to, 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 to train and maybe mentor, but improvement needs to be in, in everyone's job. Um, uh, and that's why actually the, the bronze training, I, I'm, I'm trying to get it part of mandatory training and I'm having conversations with my chief people officer at the moment about can we just do that because that would make sense. Thanks very much, Glenn. Any other questions or reflections on, on risk management appetite? Also? Yeah, yeah, just building on what um, you've just said there, Glenn, we've um, gone on a very similar journey. So I think in our organisation, we're trying to use improvement as a vehicle to really address some of our large-scale risks. 
And I think what's been really interesting is our response to our later CQC inspection. So we're trying to really make improvement a fundamental way that we respond. And we had a conversation as an exec team about how a good organisation would respond very quickly to some of the challenges. So to give you an example, it was around oxygen prescribing um, and our compliance went from around 40% to 88% um, with a, a really rapid 30-day improvement cycle. So we're trying to hardwire improvement into our organisational annual plan and objectives. But the risk is always, can you maintain that at the times of extreme pressure? When, you know, we've all felt that pressure, haven't we? Where the need to respond and deliver a real shift in the metrics very quickly doesn't always allow an improvement approach. So we're working now at the moment with our ops teams to really try and understand how we do both together. How we get our operational teams focused on some of the, the things they can do more quickly and how we work alongside the teams from an improvement perspective to really find the solutions when we you know, need to do something different um, to get those better results. It's really helpful reflections, Elsa. I'm, can I I'm just come in, can yeah, I come in on the risk appetite? Because I think, um, yes, you absolutely need to adjust risk appetite, but you need to adjust it on the things that are really important to you, not have a reckless free-for-all. So I think you, if there's something that you really want to achieve, um, then you need to empower people to make mistakes, you need to empower people to do things differently, you need to empower... Um, uh, things to happen differently and work differently with partners and we need enough of that across the system so I think we can all agree on that but if you try and do it across everything it'll it'll you know falter because it's too di it's too diffuse and it's too unspecific so we've done it particularly as a couple of people in the room know about ambulance stack and taking calls off the ambulance which required us to change our risk appetite for who we would take in terms of people from who would have been conveyed to hospital otherwise that required us to do something different in terms of risk about the, uh, the staff that needed to, to work in the community to support those and how they could, um, how they could work to, to facilitate that. So I think you need to change the risk appetite in, in the areas that are really important to you. And therefore, as an organisation, you need to be really clear about what is important to you in the long term. A really important bit of nuance there. Thank you, Elliot. Um, this is back up and running, but I know there were questions that... Um, several people kind of gave a thumbs up to about the role of NEDs on the board uh, and making sure that they're kind of engaged in um, this focus on, on continuous in improvement. And I wonder if I could just ask for some reflections on how you've ensured that you've got cross-board sign-up um, to, to this approach. And uh, again, perhaps we could start with, with Glenn and, and, and take the questions, reflections from other panellists. Yeah, I mean, it's very much the unitary board approach, isn't it? That, that if, we, if we're really clear about what our strategy is and what our annual objectives are, and that those are co-produced with, with the people who use our service and our, and our workforce, then the board is aligned. And, uh, and I've already said, we, we, we've, we've done the, the CUSA training for our, for our non-execs as well as part of that board training <coughs> work. And what we're trying to encourage the non-execs to to support is that culture of, of listening and learning. So when they when they go out and visit wards and departments, as non-execs like to do, um, they're they're in listening mode and uh, and permissive mode for me people making changes rather than coming in and thinking uh, you know they can tell people what to do. But we've got some excellent non-execs who work in other sectors that have got that have had and do have really good improvement methodologies so so they've they've added to the the rich tapestry of of the organizational culture that says it's you know the people who experience it on a daily basis are the ones to fix it you coming in on that one i was going to say so we um, historically we had um ned's sponsor teams like as an exec sponsor if you like of teams involved in improvement work so actually going out to those areas clinical areas and saying using the language of improvement so, so like glenn says we've signed up as a board to quality improvement strategy this is the way that we do it and actually going out and using that language so what tests are you under underway with at the moment what does your data show and starting to share that common language around uh, improvement historically we have done that in the past and found that to be really useful i think one of the things i'm really passionate about measurement for improvement and ailsa mentioned it before but i think if you can get neds understanding the data that they see using measurement for improvement they then start to ask slightly different questions about what it is showing them. So 
I, I understand we need performance data in the NHS and we have red, amber, greens for a reason. We need to know whether we're on track for things. But actually, sometimes it's useful to see data using run charts and SPC charts to say, actually, whilst month X looks much worse, it's actually within control limits. So maybe we ask different questions about what's going on in that system. And so I think having that sort of improvement understanding and that common language it helps NEDS as well. Thanks very much, John. Um, I wonder if we could also come back at this, at this juncture to the challenge of leading improvement across organisational boundaries. I know, John, it was something that you um, mentioned at the beginning when you've got pathways that run beyond your organisation. And could you just all give some reflections on um, how you're beginning to do that work with system partners? Perhaps, John, you could start us off and Elsa and we'll go... We'll go from there. Yeah, um, so th th there's two bits, isn't there, to improvement. So, so I suppose I'm coming at this from a kind of a, a QI practitioner point of view. So I've only recently become director of QI at the Northern Care Alliance. And two aspects to improvement. It's kind of the technical, how do you do it? What's the methodology to run the project? How, what's the, what's, is it lean? Is it IHI? Is it, is it whatever? But then the bit that nobody really teaches you is about the relationships and how you develop those to get people to do work that's in the common good of the system and the patients that use the system and the staff that use the system. And so I think we don't recognize that well enough uh, often, or we, maybe it's something that's hard to put into a project plan. So I've got an example, and I'll not go into the details of, of, of where it was, but we as an organization came together as a group uh, in 2016. As I said, we legally transacted that last year. And we tried to work on a pathway piece across the, 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 the group. And the first year of meeting with the clinicians around this particular problem was to build the will to work together and to get to know each other and to develop a shared understanding of what the different parts of that pathway looked like in the different parts of the organization. And then to start think about, well, how do we bring it together into something that improves the whole? Um, so I'm not sure that's a necessarily a particularly succinct answer to the question, but I think it's relationships. and. I think we've got to put the time and effort into how we develop those relationships as improvers because I did sales training years ago, I was terrible at it, but some of the things that I remember from sales are that people buy from people. So unless you can get to know people, it's very hard to get them to do what you want them to do. And so I think for me, I'm sort of really aware of that relationship part of a, an initial piece of pathway work that cuts across boundaries. Really powerful. Thank you, John. Elsa, any reflections? Yeah, so, so I think I'd have um, a couple um, Jenny. So the first would be the, the, the FCA approach um, and, and really when you start to do that pathway work using the, the FCA methodology, that does really bring in um, people involved in all elements of the pathway. So in our big rooms, we have GPs, we have NWAS colleagues, we have social care staff, we have patients. So that has given us a really different foundation, I think, for what we're now trying to work on at that ICS level. So I don't think the evidence base is as strong for, um, for the research evidence base isn't as strong for improvement at a system level. So we have gone on a journey and really with the support of our provider collaborative chairs and chief executives. So this is real thanks to their vision and they tasked us just over a year ago to work together as QI leads. So the provider um, organisation, QI leads, with our clinical leads, we're really fortunate in Langs and South Cumbria that we've got a number of Generation Q fellows, IHI fellows, IHI trained improvement <coughs> advisors. We've got a critical mass of improvers and clinicians all wanting to redesign and work better. But actually what we've really started to do is look at how do we need to function differently now to work at that ICS level. So the feedback from the CQC around boards now need to have a line of sight on the measures across the whole system, not just your organisation from their um, later system reviews that they've done or inspections. And what we've started to do is to think about what does improvement at system level really need. So we've been working with John Clarkson at Cambridge University, who's led lots of the work on engineering better care, to think about how do we make that shift from the process improvements that we've largely focused on as a, a network of improvers 
to really understanding how we re-engineer our system differently. And it's really early work, but what our system senior leadership have done is created the opportunity for us to take the time to plan that properly. So we've set up a steering committee in our ICS. It's chaired by David Levy, our medical director. And we've got a think tank and a do tank. And we're really trying to take the learning from people like the King's Fund and the Health Foundation to put the time and effort into really understanding how we're going to do it and making sure that we understand how the improvement of systems within systems within systems really does connect together so we avoid some of the unintended consequences that we see when we do improvement within our just one organization very early days a lot of work to do uh, but if any of you are starting to work at an ics level i'd really be keen to talk to you about how you're planning that and how your board is contributing to that Great open invitation there, Elsa. Thank you. I'm sure people will take you up on that. Um, Elliot and Glenn, any, any reflections? Yeah, a couple of reflections. Um, I'd agree ab about relationships, and I think it's about uh, trust um, and honesty in those, in those relationships across the system and, uh, and building that. Um, as I say, within my organisation, trust and confidence is not an instruction. It's a feeling that you build over time, and actually it takes time to build that, and it takes time to, um, to build that common purpose. And I think it's about common purpose and working between organisations that have different priorities at different times, different timescales, um, is difficult. It's not straightforward, and I shouldn't, don't think we should pretend it's straightforward, because I think we then make people feel um, rubbish about the fact that they're not making as much progress as they think they ought to be. It is quite difficult. It does require the relationships to be right. But I do think we need to find common purpose around um, patients, and I think we need to find common purpose when you look at the patient pathway for children and children's mental health and children's learning disability, for example. It's a terrible pathway universally across the country. Actually, um, if we focused on that, we'd be much clearer about um, releasing the power of organisations to do something different within that. So um, I think those things are important in that, and, and recognising it's difficult is, is important as well. Thank you, Elliot. And Glenn, I, I think there's some interesting kind of reflections potentially from the foundation group about the role of provider collabs as a kind of bridge to building um, improvement capability across system partners, and that's something that you've been looking at in your patch. Yeah, be between the, the, the members of the group, it's about sharing between them, but actually the, the real provider collaborative is, is what goes on at place, actually, that, that their lead provider roles. So I think, I think it's really important for us to define the system mm -hmm. because integrated care systems are not what our staff would say in the system. The system is, is the process through which patients flow. Um, and, you know, there's huge opportunities to apply improvement methodology to that. You know, the, the gaps, mind the gap, you could use that, the, the gaps and overlaps between services that, that really do um, frustrate people so what we what we've done with our improvement training is is invited all of the the partners at place into that so so primary care social care voluntary sector are in that room doing the doing the learning uh, and obviously creating relationships as a result of that we also do our leadership training together as well and look at system leadership so i i, th I think rather than taking it up to to whole group level or whole ics level it's how they behave with partners in place, which is key. The group just provides an opportunity for us to share that best practice and see that something's going well in Herefordshire or, or Warwickshire North or South Warwickshire, uh, and then take it, but not take it in its entirety, take it and, and, and adapt and adopt. It makes me think of the, uh, one of the learnings from the VMI evaluation about uh, peer learning and knowledge sharing being such a key driver of of, uh, of improvement. And Jenny, can I just come back on that point? I think um, what we're trying to replicate, Glenn, is what you've described, but because we don't have that formal group model, I think it's really important that whatever you know configuration we've all got, we find that way to connect our teams. So our, our first programme we're working on is around frailty and respiratory, and we are absolutely focused on delivery at place, but bringing those teams together so they can learn from each other in the absence of that group structure that, that you've got. Thanks, Elsa. While we're on a kind of system theme, I'm just going to pull out a question here 
from a delegate that's asked, to what extent do you think ICBs could or should be supporting quality improvement in trusts? Anyone have a, have a thought on that? <laughs> Certainly should. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think it, it's, it's very similar to what we've described with, with boards around organisations, isn't it? it? It's about recognising the value of inverting the, the leadership model to, to put teams in control and to give them the skills to do so uh, and to not pounce on them if it goes wrong and to seize control if it goes wrong um, uh, and setting clear organisational objectives and strategy that, that gives them a clue as to what we're, we're collectively all trying to achieve um, and combining progress against that with some of the ideas that the teams have. So I think, I think it applies at, at ICB level in the same way it does at organisational level. The same set of principles, Elliot. Can I come in on, on that? I, I'm somewhat amused, or, although somewhat distressed by the question, that why would they not be um, involved in, in that and want to be interested in that? So I think, uh, I think commissioning uh, has a real place in the system, and I think good commissioning is, is invaluable, actually, within the system, both to, to coordinate what is going on between providers who don't always see eye to eye and actually need to, to be brought together sometimes in a, in a way uh, that is helpful across the system, but also the coordination outside of, uh, with uh, VCSFE and, and other parts of the system. So I think good commissioning can play a really important part in setting the tone, unblocking things, um, making the sure that the patient perspective is, is heard. Uh, I think it'd be fair to say that we don't always, across all parts of the country, get good commissioning all the time. And I think that might be the inference of the question. I think bad commissioning would then be, we'll go back to a contractual form or we'll go back to a contractual basis um, and it becomes very transactional. And I think that's not where the real value in commissioning lies from my perspective. Uh, unsurprisingly, there's uh, quite a few thumbs up for a question on um, commenting on the Secretary of State for Health's approach to delivering improvement with the appointment of Tim Briggs for elective recovery and, and Sarah Jane Marsh for... Um, urgent and emergency care that was um, announced by Steve Barclay this morning. How can this central drive be balanced with a local QI approach? And John, I wonder if I could ask you to, to comment on that. Um, well, I suppose that's up to trust, isn't it? So you've got your, your, your strategy. Um, we have a quality improvement strategy for the Northern Carolinas that sets out what we want to achieve for the next uh, three years in quality improvement for the organisation. And I guess the central drive is something which has always been the case in, in whatever form, hasn't it? Just because we've got two new people in that space, I suppose it, it trusts uh, will be used to it as an issue. I suppose within, f speaking from my own personal uh, experience working at senior level in quality improvement, you always have to recognise that you need some bad with bandwidth of the people who work in your team to be able to respond to the stuff that comes centrally. Um, it, it can be really challenging, but in the the the, um, the GERFT work, as an example, you know that's something which has been effective, at showing improvement in organisations. So something to be celebrated, and so supporting that for us as a QI team is really important. So I suppose in summary, so it's managing the workload between what you identify as your local priorities and what comes through centrally. Else is yeah, there. just building on what John said there, I think this is a really key test. So Martin um, is in the audience. Martin's our chief exec at East Lanks. And Martin and I were having a conversation this morning, and you may want to say something about this, Martin, but actually as a board, how embedded is QI and how mature is our approach to QI? Because those organisations that have a well-embedded um, approach to improvement are very likely to go fierce to improvement to deliver the challenges. And, and those that aren't maybe are likely to revert to other things first. And I, I think that's a really, it's a question that we've been grappling with as a board. Where have we got to on that level of maturity of our approach? And I think if we can really work together to, um, you know, as John said, make sure we've got the bandwidth and improvement capability to work alongside our frontline teams, then I think we'll get somewhere different in our response. I don't know whether Martin, you do want to come uh, in on that one. <laughs> Yeah, Martin Hodgson, Chief Exec of East Langs. Uh, we are a vital signs trust. Um, I think 
previously East Lang's um, improvement practice was a bit of a bolt on. So, so we applied it when we had an operational pressure, so ambulance handovers, etc. I think it's become how we do things now. So when there is a problem, you know, we apply the, the, the improvement methodology. And I think when you start seeing outcomes in terms of patient experience and safety emanating through the improvement practice, that was a bit of a barometer for the board that it's, it's getting embedded. So we've done stuff in terms of nutrition, hydration, end of life care, et cetera. So um, it has been a bit of a journey. Um, going back to the system stuff as well, we're all in different places in Lank South Cumbria, but there's a, um, a commitment for want of a better word to, to level up, to all get us in the same place in terms of CQC or SOC ratings, et cetera. So, um, we've been concentrating on some of the wicked problems that we all face. So there's just been a system-wide value stream event in terms of bank and agency staffing and how do we collectively work on that. So, uh, you know, um, but yeah, I, I think it's been a journey, but it's how you get it to how you do things as a matter of course. Thank you very much. That's great. And Elliot? I, I, just, I mean, from a... Having worked in a national improvement organisation for some time, I think it's, it's about the spread of good practice. So having uh, people who are at the centre coming up with great ideas about how we can collectively solve the problems that we face collectively, we don't face different problems. And actually, if there are some uh, solutions that can be applied across the country, then that's great. However, uh, there's different starting points in each different system. There's a different um, infrastructure in each a different system. They, they start and can respond in very different ways. So I think the unanimity of management of that is, it would be problematic, I think, but coming up with great suggestions about how we can look at things differently and how we can do things differently is never gonna be a bad thing. Which probably brings me to the point about how you spread improvement generally, which is that you don't spread it by having an hour's conversation or having an hour's lecture or having a page of A4 that says this is the great stuff that we've done in one place. You need a dialogue about how you can engage the local staff and, and engage them to understand what changes they need to make and then pick it up, which is a slightly longer process than we sometimes give ourselves time for. Thank you, Elliot. And Glenn, I know you wanted to come in on that one. Yeah, I suppose the, the question about those two appointments, um, two people who absolutely believe in improvement, actually, and who use data. Mm. Um, uh, and that's obviously what, what we all do as part of our approach. And, and working with Sarah Jane on the task force, what, what, we, what we learned on the discharge task force is the systems that were not doing so well were, were falling out and disagreeing about the data. Those who actually had a single version of the truth that, that they relied upon, uh, and then they were focused on the improvements around it. So, so yeah, I'm, 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 I'm pleased to hear the announcements and look forward to, to working on them because I mean, GERFT has been great. It's had, it's really opened up that clinical dialogue, uh, and it's all right to have some variation. And we look, we tend to look at the variation between organisations in GERFT, but actually within teams is the fascinating one. In the same environment, why is it that consultant A does something slightly different to consultant B, and and let's just hold the data up to them and see what happens. Before we, uh, we wrap up, I, I thought I should just uh, pull out a, a question here about the role that patients can play, because we've talked a lot about um, leadership behaviours and uh, empowering staff. So I, I wonder if we, if we could just have a few comments from the panel on uh, engaging patients in a kind of continuous improvement endeavour. And John, I'm going to ask you to pick that one up. Uh, can have a huge role, but I think how well we do it is probably quite patchy in QI across the NHS. I think some organisations do it better than others. I think often it's because it's not uh, something that we find desperately easy to do. Um, so I think they can play a huge role. And we, we've just run a service user experience collaborative at the Northern Care Alliance over the last year, um, which has been really successful. And we've had patients involved at every level of that, so testing changes, but also on the on the governance of that piece of work as well, opening sessions for our teams when they come and talk about the project and what they're doing. So they can have a huge role, but I think actually as improvers and people working within the NHS, uh, we've probably got to get better at how we go about involving them. Thanks, John and Elsa. 
Yeah, I, I would agree, John. I think there's a massive scope for us to do things differently here. One of the things we've tried to do recently, which I think has delivered a different outcome for us, is actually walk alongside our patients through the pathway. And we've had a number of people at different levels of the organisation doing this. So some of our executives have done it, some of our clinicians have done it, some of our admin and operational teams have done it, where we literally meet the patient at the front door of our organisation. One actually, um, one of our ops leads said, I'm going to go to the patient's house because I think patients are struggling to get to our organisation. So we're trying to take that beyond the walls of our organisation. But actually, when you do that, you see something really different. So we've done a lot of work around actually what are the barriers that we're pu putting in place for our patients. Just some real basics, some of the signage, some of the letters we send, some of the way we communicate. But actually, where we've seen the greatest value is where patients have joined us in the big room and we have been able to understand what improvements they want us to deliver. So not delivering the things that we want to do, um, but really understanding what adds value from the patient perspective. And that's led to, um, and we've been doing some work in parallel, but we've rolled out from this learning. Uh, one of our colorectal surgeons has designed a patient contribution to case notes. Um, and we did a thematic analysis of that in the colorectal big room that I'm in to really guide where we work and, and focus our improvement for patients. But we're in the process of rolling that out across our organisation. So our patients have got a mechanism to really co-design their care with our clinical teams. Last comments from Elliot and, and Glenn on, on engaging patients. I think you're right. I don't think we do it nearly enough and I don't think we do it with nearly enough bravery. I think sometimes if we focus on specific <laughs> pathways, it can be difficult to find the right patient to give us the feedback across the whole pathway. So I think there's something that we probably need to, to learn. I'm not quite sure who we learn it from because I don't think, I, I'd be fabulous to know that someone in the NHS is doing it brilliantly, but I don't hear <laughs> of it, um, to, to get engagement across the pathway. But I think in some cases, I referred to children's services earlier, I think they'll be quite challenging. And I think actually then how do we, as, a, as an organisation, as an NHS, respond to that in a positive way r rather than respond to that in a defensive way? Because I think we could learn a huge amount from doing that across organisations and across systems, actually, uh, where the, the connection isn't there for patients. But I think we've got to be quite brave to hear it and then respond to it genuinely. Yeah, I, I, uh, I chair the improvement boards in the trust. Um, I let other exec directors chair other more boring things, but I, I, I really <laughs> enjoy chairing it. And I think it also signals the importance of it. And I suppose one of the things that we always do there, so when, when someone's feeding back on an improvement project, the, one of the first questions is, so how have you assessed the impact uh, on patient experience and, and patient outcomes? And there's no one way to do this, as you said, but... I'm always keen to see how they have done it, and sometimes they've done it in a really great way that we can then learn from. Uh, so I'd rather not tell them how to, but always ask them whether they have, uh, and I think that's important. Fantastic. Well, I'd, I'd like to really thank our panel at this point for some... I feel like we could have keep, kept on going for at least a, another hour and, and fantastic questions from all of you in the room, and I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them, but I think it's a kind of a testimony to the quality of the insights that shared from the panel, and, and I want to thank you all, four of you, so much for your time uh, today, and thank you very much to delegates in the room. Can I just do a really quick plug at this point to um, a project that uh, NHS Providers has been working on with the Health Foundation and the Q community over the last 18 months, where we've been looking at sharing some very practical peer learning on the role of boards in, in uh, driving continuous improvement. And there are um, resources on our website, including a guide for boards um, on improvement, which uh, pulls together some of the resources and uh, short reads that might be helpful for you in your role. Uh, and we've got further events, peer learning events coming up. So do keep an eye out on that. And uh, we're also focusing on um, leading improvement across organizational boundaries as a theme of today. So that's a a really strong partnership with the Health Foundation and the Q community has got uh, a stand in our exhibition space, so do uh, go and speak to them to find out more, and I think they've left some information on tables as well. So thank you all very much. I think it's been a really rich session. Thank you to the panel.